Welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes. This event is a webinar. So if you're an attendee, the host and the panelists can't see and hear you, but you can ask a question using the Q&A interface. This webinar will be recorded and live streamed on Indivisible Illinois' Facebook page. The recording will be available in English and in Spanish after the event, along with the slides. I'm Lenny Manah Hoppenworth, co-chair of Indivisible Illinois. Welcome to Confronting the Rise of School Board Disruptions. I'll go over some logistics now before the main program gets started. First, this program will be interpreted simultaneously in Spanish. Go to the interpretation button and select Spanish. Please ask questions as we go along with the Q&A interface. We're hoping to cover the majority of these questions along um, during the program with that interface. And we'll do a few live questions at the end. If you have unanswered questions at the end of the program, please reach out by email to Illinois Families for Public Schools at info at ilfps.org or Indivisible Illinois at general at indivisibleil.com. We'll start this webinar recording and live stream right now. And in a moment, you'll hear from Cassie Cresswell, Director of Illinois Families for Public Schools. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we have one quick tech thing to do. We're also gonna record this Spanish. Um, Ken, uh, we have uh, the that started um, and also can we give, permission to Jen to record this Spanish audio. Um, and then we'll have the, um, we'll have Irene give instructions in Spanish as well. Hey, um, Irene, do you want to come onto the English channel and give instructions as well, uh, if you can switch? Okay, so I think we are good to go now. Um, and okay, so I will start uh, with the, the introductions and main program. Um, so welcome and good evening. I'm Cassie Cresswell, the Director of Illinois Families for Public Schools. We're really thrilled to have people from all over the state on the call tonight. Uh, earlier in the week, we counted more than 90 cities and towns represented. Um, so people are here to learn more about what's been happening around the country uh, and also across Illinois with attacks on school boards and educators. Um, and uh, most importantly, we'll be hearing about what concrete steps we can take together in our communities to connect with others and push back. Uh, the planning for this event has been a collaboration between Illinois Families for Public Schools, Indivisible Illinois, and the Social Justice of Indivisible Illinois. In addition, we are really grateful for the array of organizations that are co-sponsoring this event. Um, and uh, we're just super excited to have this just broad reach around the state. And, you know, the, we're, we have organizations here representing parents, teachers, lawyers, advocates, organizers, voters, uh, and protecting our public schools to serve all our state's children and protecting our locally elected democratic governance bodies that run them will require a broad and intersectional coalition. And I think we, this event is uh, important, not just for the information we're sharing, but that, uh, we're beginning to build that coalition. Um, before we get started with our speakers, we just wanted to put a couple poll questions out there. Um, and so you can see who is here tonight. 
with you. Um, if you, let's here, I think I can run this. Um, uh, I'm not sure how to make it so you can all see it. Let's see here. <laughs> okay, so that should be popping up on your screen. Um, and we're asking, what's your role? Um, where do you live? Um, a little typo in there. And uh, basically, what are the issues that have come up with disinformation in your school board meetings, if any? Um, and uh, let us know. Give you a second here to answer. Sure, how long I should let everyone get. We're still getting on participants here, so um, we'll let everyone keep on answering. Um, and while we're we're waiting for answers to come in, um, before we get started for our, with our first speaker, I just wanted to point out a couple stats that I think are really heartening um, and that people should take away from this event that you know, there's been this coordinated effort around the country for the last year to weaponize public schools addressing issues of gender, ethnicity, and race, and also public schools using COVID mitigation measures. Um, but you know, the, the stats are that actually um, the you know, majority of people polled um, in our country actually um, are on the side of uh, factual information and COVID mitigation. So there was a new study out from UCLA uh, that talks about um, the basically this weaponizing and this anti CRT campaign and there's been dozens of bills around the country that have been introduced on things like, uh, you know, pushing banning critical race theory discussions, etc. But and and like to the point that a third of all K-12 students in the United States are in a district where there've been local actions along these lines. Uh, but the truth is that recent polls show that the majority of Americans agree that students should learn in schools about race and racism. Um, and this is similar to what we're seeing uh, with respect to COVID mitigation measures. Polling shows that a majority of Americans support mask mandates. Uh, in December, that was around 69% supporting businesses requiring masks. And uh, that was you know, barely changed from August earlier. Uh, and so I think we need to keep those numbers in mind as we talk about some of these attacks and know that it's not uh, the majority or even, you know, it's not like a half and half thing, um, but it is a very vocal minority and it takes a lot of organizing uh, on the, part of uh, all of us to push back on things like this. So we can end our poll now um, and look at some of these results. Uh, looks like we have um, like about 37% of people on the call are parents, 14% said teachers, and there's overlap in those things. Um, and 41% uh, said community public ed supporters. Uh, 21 people said that they were school board members for where people lived. Uh, a quarter of people was selected in Northern Illinois, about 44% said Chicago suburbs, 12% said Chicago, another 12 were outside Illinois, um, and then some smaller percentages in Southern and Central Illinois. So gives us a good idea of like the, the array here. Um, okay, so we'll go on to our first speaker now. Um, well, first I'll do the little, so you know, the, the order of events here. We have this welcome. Our first speaker is gonna be Jim McGrath, kind of giving you a little overview of school board disruptions in Illinois. Um, then we have a panel of four speakers. We'll talk about action steps after that. Um, and then we'll also have some parent organizing perspective at the end um, and cover some Q and A uh, at the end as well. Uh, okay, so I will introduce uh, our first speaker now. It's Jim McGrath. He volunteers with uh, NWSA, NWS OFA Indivisible and the Social Justice Alliance of Indivisible Illinois. Um, and he's been sharing information about school board disruptions and disinformation on a monthly basis since last summer. Uh, Jim will cover some basic background on what's been happening in Illinois and why. Um, 
And Thank so- Thank you, Cassie. Okay, so, so let's get started. Um, so we'll just hit on a couple of high points here. Um, what do are, are what are creating all these disruptions in school boards? And I want to make a point of there's disrupt there's uh, there's disinformation and there's misinformation. We are going to talk about the disinformation that is being uh, spread. Misinformation is just a mistake that somebody makes. So we are focused on disinformation. So there's mask mandates that people are upset about. Ma vaccine mandates is critical race theory, which is beyond critical race theory. Uh, LGBTQ, social distancing, COVID, COVID quarantines. What, uh, what these are are actually dog whistle issues. Now, some of the parents who are uh, talking to school boards really believe that these are their primary issues. But in the, in, in the, in the long term, they, what these are are issues just to get the base of parents involved. So next, next slide, Cassie. So again, a little bit of detail, what are the issues? And we'll use CRT as an example here. And as you, as you just read the last sentence here, um, the right, and th this is very difficult to be a nonpartisan presentation because all of these issues are, are coming from well-funded groups on, on the right. So I uh, apologize for that, but that's, that's where this is coming from. Um, so the right is res resorted to its usual dog whistle strategy of distraction and division. So as, as I mentioned before, those are dog whistle issues. Uh, most recent, they've most recently latched onto this critical race theory, which has actually been created by a member of the Manhattan Institute. Um, and he's attached everything he can to cr critical race theory. Um, and critical race theory, as we know, in, there isn't a, a grade school or high school that actually teaching critical race theory. It's a college level course. Now with political correctness in the 1990s or cancel culture, uh, they've made school and college campuses a primary battleground for stoking fears about what, what and how we teach our kids. So, and those fears are uh, fears of losing the, uh, the white privilege which, which is why we're, we're, we're holding this, this, uh, this seminar tonight. Next, next slide, Casey. Okay, so words to watch for. Um, these, these words have been co-opted by, by these groups that we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's patriot or patriotism. If you recall, everybody that participated in the January 6th insurrection was referred to by the groups that participated as a patriot. So you gotta be careful with these words. Liberty, that's not liberty as we all think about it, is their definition of liberty. Same thing with freedom. Patriotic education, uh, that is something that is typically seen in authoritarian countries. But that's something that some of these groups are pushing and critical race theory again. Indoctrination, I became interested in, in, in studying this because I was visiting school boards in various areas and I saw indoctrination being talked about in, in all of these different school boards. So I realized this isn't a local issue. It's being, it's being promulgated by national uh, well-funded groups. Intimidation, intimidation, harassment, two nice words for bullying, which is what this is. And then parental rights uh, or choice. Next slide. So here's, here's how they're using the word indoctrination. Now, this was a sign in, uh, in Leesburg, Virginia, but education, not indoctrination. That's what I was seeing on signs um, all the way up into uh, 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 College of Lake County uh, and uh, Palatine, Barrington, uh, school boards all around the, the Northern Illinois area. Uh, next slide. So is it happening here in Illinois? Now we're using Illinois. I realize there's a lot of people that are from outside of Illinois that are, that are uh, on this, but I, I, I've, I've got some examples from Illinois. Uh, the first one is in El Elmhurst, uh, December of 2021, just happened. Uh, the reason that his microphone was taken away was he would not give the microphone up at the end of his allotted time frame. 
Okay, anti-mask, that's Lyon Township, LTH, is Lyon Township High School. Um, they accuse the board of trying to shut us up. Uh, and that's not the case. When you speak at a school board meeting, you have a limited amount of time. That's not trying to shut anybody up. That's the way the school boards work. Um, disruption at a, at a Unity High School meeting in Menden, Illinois. The man was so disruptive, he was taken out of the meeting and arrested. Uh, another Lyons Township uh, example, they're calling Black Lives Matter a Marxist movement, which we know it is not. Uh, what, what's going on, Cassie? Cassie, can we get back to the presentation? Yeah, sorry, I, I clicked in the spot on the link and now that is my, my thing. Let me stop it and start it. Stop share and come on thing. Sorry, everybody. Okay, can you make it full screen? Yeah, I got it freaking out. There we go. Okay, so here's a bunch of examples um, across uh, different school boards in, in Northern Illinois. And we'll talk about a little bit more about this Glen Ellen Elementary School students. Uh, I've got a photograph uh, of, of what's going on there. This Barrington, I attended that school board meeting, 60 speakers, it went on for five hours. Um, and then this last one is uh, uh, at Taft High School, the, uh, the principal realized that there was a group trying to start this Turning Point USA. He looked into it and decided that they do not uh, value, they, they, their values don't coordinate with the school's values. So he refused to let them organize at his high school. So next page. So this is what's going on in Glen Ellen at this Forest Glen school. And this is a grade school, elementary school. As kids were walking to school with their masks, parents were lining the sidewalks and streets and harassing the kids. And again, I will say harassment is a nice word for bullying and bullying is not acceptable at any level. Next, next slide. So. Sorry about that, Jim, it clicks to the wrong picture. Great. So I'm just gonna go through quickly. So here's some of the, organ the national organizations that are uh, we're, we're dealing with. This first one is American Legislative Exchange Council, also called ALEC. They write legislation that is then given to legislators in various different state legislators. If you're wondering why some of these like voter suppression laws are similar in different states, it's because they are, they come from this organization. So here's a number of groups um, that, uh, and I'm gonna kind of skip to the bottom down here, turning point uh, in, uh, or no left turn in education. They're fighting against lessons in systemic racism. All we are, all we are asking for is a, uh, non, just a true uh, accounting of our, of our history, a non-sanitized version. Moms for Liberty, they are even uh, starting, and, 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 and by the way, Turning Point USA does the same thing, a list of teachers and professors that they don't like. If, if, if you don't like what, what somebody says, they are cr uh, creating a list, uh, which is very scary in my opinion. So next page. So here's what's happening. Um, what they're doing is they use the media to drum up a culture war. That's one of the things that uh, critical race theory is being used for, uh, or gender issues. Then they win elections by stoke, stoking voter fears. That's what happened in Virginia. If you remember, that was a lot, a lot of that was about critical race theory, which I didn't see one interview of a voter in Virginia who could explain what critical race theory was, but they knew they didn't want it, even though it wasn't being taught. So it's, it, it, it flipped the election. 
Then they frame attempts to update the, critic, the curricula as a radical attack on American values. American values is interpreted to be um, uh, white privilege. That's what, they, that's what they mean by that. Um, and then demand vouchers for privately man managed charter schools. What they want to do is defund the public schools. And once they do that, they take, they take the money out of, out of our, our public schools. The public schools can't afford the teachers that they need. And that becomes obviously a big problem. Uh, and then they support politicians who support uh, education cuts, uh, charter schools, and voucher schemes, which we don't want. So, okay, next page, Cassie. So bottom line is the organizations that, that we saw, and this is just some of them. For example, there's one group that funds organizations throughout the United States. One group looked at just 28 of the organizations that that one funding group funded, just 28 of the total that they funded. So they, they wanna maintain the sanitized version of American history. Uh, we wanna energize their base of voters for the, the upcoming election. Not just a school board election that's coming up in Illinois in April of 2023, but for this coming election. So what can we do? Uh, Joyce is going to have a list of actions that there's uh, there's something for that everybody can do on her list. Uh, so it, it's quite extensive. Please stay on and, and listen to that list that Joyce has. So one more click, Cassie. Ah. No. And last, <laughs> no, never mind. The last click was just remember that a an energized minority can overcome a complacent majority. So we can't be a complacent majority if we think what we what we believe is what we what we want what we want to do. So please listen to what Joyce has to say and let's get active. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, our next part of the, the program is going to be our panelists. I'll introduce them one at a time and we'll hear from each one of them. Um, the first one is uh, we're, we're going to hear from four speakers taking sort of a national, a state, a district, and then more of a school classroom perspective on these attacks, what's happening, why it's happening, and also why it's really important for the good of our public schools and public school students to push back. Um, so first is Jennifer Berkshire, an author and journalist. Uh, most recently, she's been the co-author with education historian Jack Schneider of A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door which is a book examining the push to privatize the US K-12 school system. Jennifer and Jack can be heard on the education podcast, Have You Heard? Um, and Jennifer has been monitoring and reporting on the tax on school boards, school COVID safety and curriculum for many months. And that's what we will hear from her tonight. Go so take it away, Jeff and uh, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am coming to you from Massachusetts, where we are awaiting um, what they're now saying is the storm of the century. Um, they're saying that Boston could have something like 30 inches. But I'm originally from Illinois. I grew up down the road in Springfield, and my sister is a teacher in Southern Illinois, and I should say that I'm also a proud graduate of Eastern Illinois University. So my job is to give you, paint for you a kind of brief picture of what's happening nationally. And as Cassie mentioned, I am a journalist and I host a podcast. And that means that I'm fortunate enough to get to talk to people all over the country who are experiencing exactly what Jim just described. And also I get to you know, come away with some heartening examples where I think people are doing a really good job of pushing back in ways that are effective. So first of all, I know that your focus is primarily on school board disruptions, but I think it's really important that we understand the broader context of what's happening here. As Cassie mentioned in her introductory remarks, something like a third of the students in the United States are now attending schools in districts that are covered by these 
these education gag orders, which is really the only way to describe them. These are these limits on discussions of, of racism and race in the classroom that we started to see being swiftly enacted last year. So there's good news and some bad news, and I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is that we're already seeing in the early month of this, you know, the, the new legislative session around the country, that the new bills that are being proposed are even more extreme than the initial ones that we saw. They're broader in scope, they're being enacted more quickly, and they apply not to, just to this sort of amorphously described divisive concepts, but increasingly they're focused on things like LGBTQ issues. For example, there's a bill that it seems to be hurtling towards the governor's desk in Florida called the Don't Say Gay Bill, which would basically ban schools from uh, from dealing with any topics having to do with gay or transgender issues, even if, say, you know, students raise the issue in the classroom. You can also imagine what this would mean for gay or lesbian teachers. So we're seeing that there is, uh, that the issues are broadening, the, um, the punishments in these bills are getting more extreme too. One thing that we're seeing that I think that's really relevant to this discussion is that an increasing number of these bills don't just allow parents to sue schools, school districts, and even teachers, but they encourage them to do that by attaching monetary stakes, by paying for lawyers' fees, by giving some kind of monetary reward if the, the parents win the, the case. And we're seeing this kind of language pop up in all sorts of bills. Some of them ban divisive concepts, quote unquote, like we saw last year, but the Florida bill that I just mentioned that's being labeled the Don't Say Gay Bill also allows for this private right of action that encourages parents to take legal action against these various entities. Now, why does this matter to you? Because what we're seeing is basically what, it, there's a law professor at UCLA who I think just summed this up so neatly with the description of, you know, the grievance industrial complex, that basically you, you don't just empower parent voice, but you encourage, you encourage parents to translate individual grievances into lawsuits against schools and districts in, in a way that seems absolutely guaranteed to make the running of schools more and more difficult. And you, you end up in this situation where the preferences of individual parents translate into loss of, le of learning opportunity for whole groups of students. And I think that's really dangerous. So I mentioned that there was some good news, and there is actually some good news. The flip side of what I've been describing as this kind of growing extremism at the legislative ish, at le legislative level is turning off more people. As the more extreme these measures get, the more that a sort of uh, you know a, a generic protest around parent rights becomes linked to demanding that very specific books be pulled from libraries, for example, the more uncomfortable the public gets with that. Jim mentioned that we've seen a version of this movie before in the 1990s, and that is so true, and I think that's really important for us to, to recognize. I wrote a story about this late last year, and I was just absolutely astonished to go back and read about what happened in the 1990s, how familiar it felt, and how many of the same names that we're familiar with now popped up then. Um, you probably remember the name Betsy DeVos. We just said goodbye to her. Well, in the 1990s, she headed up an organization that had the goal of enshrining in every state constitution language that would, uh, that would guarantee that parents had the right to direct the education of their children. And it really looked for a while like they were gonna win. There was a lot of money behind the cause. As Jim mentioned, you know, this has been a, a right-wing priority going back decades. But then something really interesting happened. The movement ran out of steam, and it ran out of steam in places like Virginia and Colorado, because what happened was that when the public 
got to see for themselves what this concept of parent rights would actually mean, not just for schools, but really for, you know, for all sorts of organizations, for libraries, even video store owners were worried. You know, what if, what if uh, a young person brought home a video that their parents were opposed to, could they be sued too? And so you saw a cause that seemed unstoppable run out of steam. And I actually think that we're going to see something similar happen in this case. So I mentioned that I have the opportunity to all, talk to all kinds of parents and teachers around the country. So I've actually seen a number of really heartening examples where people on the ground have translated what Cassie was talking about, which is this majority support for things like addressing the concerns of LGBTQ kids in schools or, you know, teaching our history in a way that's fair. Um, I've seen examples of groups that have translated concerns about COVID mitigation into making it clear and undeniable that they are in fact the majority and that's turned out to be a really powerful way to lower the value the volume on some of the loudest voices in the room so i'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about that in the future um, so i think that that is that is pretty much it um, there is good news, there is bad news, but I think that we have the potential in this moment to actually build deeper and more powerful coalitions in defense of public education and its invaluable role in democracy. So I know that this is a very difficult topic and that it gets very heated, but we need our public schools and they need us like never before. So let's figure out a way to, to deepen those coalitions and start tonight. Thanks so much for having me and I can't wait to hear what the other panelists have to say. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I think having some historical perspective on this is really, really helpful. Um, so next up, uh, we are going to hear from Illinois State Senator Christina Pasiona Sias. Uh, she is an elected official. She's representing the Northwest side of Chicago in the Illinois General Assembly since December 2020. She's also really has an uh, amazing depth uh, in the education sphere. Uh, and she has a broad background in education policy and practice. So prior to uh, the General Assembly, she served on the Illinois State Board of Education, and she was the Associate Vice President of Policy for Erickson Institute here in Chicago. Um, and before that, she was the Director of Education at the Latino Policy Forum. Um, and even before that, she worked at Chicago Public Schools and uh, a community organization here in Chicago and LASE. In a volunteer capacity, she's served on numerous boards, um, in the education sphere, including the Illinois Early Learning Council, the Illinois State Team of the Build Initiative, the Kindergarten Transi Transition Advisory Committee of the P20 and Early Learning Councils, um, and uh, in her uh, own neighborhood, the Logan Square Neighborhood Association. Um, and she co-chaired the no nonprofit advocacy group, the Puerto Rican Agenda of Chicago for six years. Uh, so she really has a whole breadth of experience um, in the community and this very extensive knowledge of education policy and uh, now is uh, building on that in the General Assembly. So, uh, Senator, you go ahead. Thank you for the warm introduction, Cassie, and thank you to all the groups that have um, spent the time to convene us to have this conversation. Um, as I know, it's not like a one and done, right? This is going to be an ongoing discussion. There has to be significant building and um, dispelling of the, I appreciate um, how Jim explained earlier, the disinformation versus the misinformation. Um, you know, as Cassie had mentioned, uh, you know, I, I've, I have uh, kind of different hats that I wear and I've had different experiences um, that I bring to bear in this work um, in the General Assembly. Uh, first and foremost, I am a graduate of the Chicago Public Schools. I'm a proud graduate. Um, you know, my that that experience very much informed 
um, you know, how I approach education, having gone to what is now considered a selective enrollment school and understanding a lot of the disparities when it comes to our neighborhood schools, which actually then took me to my doctorate degree in educational policy and having a lot of experience hands on working in the field, both with and, and um, with within schools and in collaboration with schools and community-based organizations, but I'm also a parent. And so all these lens come together in the work that I'm doing in the General Assembly, but specifically I wanna like touch on tonight because I think it's important for folks to understand, especially because this was, um, you know, it kind of caught some headlines around this time last year. Um, but while I was serving on the State Board of Education, um, we went through a process. Um, when I came on, it was kind of midway through the process of creating what we call the culturally responsive teaching and leading standards. And the, um, the idea behind that is to really kind of get at um, creating some standards for our teacher preparation programs that acknowledged what we had come to better articulate and understand the adverse impact of when we do not have learning spaces that promote critical thinking, that um, optimize learning, and that ultimately scaffold skill building um, in a way that is inclusive, in a way that fosters belonging. Um, but ultimately, it avoids what Angela Valenzuela calls subtractive schooling, in that in order for us to be successful in, um, in school and to meet all of those kind of quote unquote achievement benchmarks for students that have been historically marginalized, whether it's because of your culture, your skin color, your language, your gender expression, your gender identity and orientation, um, it, you have to subtract yourself in order to be successful. And that is a very harmful practice that has been, you know, that has been very much kind of pervasive throughout our education system. So I wanna tell you this story about how we came about this because um, ultimately what we have to understand when we think about schools is that, you know, or, or school systems, what we have control over um, when we are sitting on these states, uh, on these boards of education. And usually with the State Board of Education, there's in any school system, there's five areas that you have control over, right? It's assessments, it's standards, it's teacher evaluation, it's teacher preparation, and it's curriculum. Curriculum is not what school boards have control over, or at least the State Board of Education doesn't have control over, right? So, us as a state board understanding this truth that we need to shift the way that we prepare teachers to be to bring them up to speed to the relevance to the diversity to the the need to invite young people into their learning process affirm their identities and not have to subtract their identities in order to be successful um, the idea was that we would then revise um, and create these teaching standards or, or these standards for teacher education programs at the university level to really inform course design, course sequencing, and the clinical experiences. This is for individuals who would be pursuing a bachelor's or a master's degree that um, would also have a professional educator license, a PEL. Um, that is that whole piece that of those five components, it's the teacher preparation piece, right? And so these programs would now have to align with these culturally responsive teaching and leading standards. Um, and it's ultimately, I want to kind of like unpack just a touch, what is culturally responsive practice and pedagogy, right? It's the understanding that children don't come to us as empty vessels, but they come to us with assets. They come to us with lived experience, with skills and with knowledge. And it's our job as educators to partner with them and their families so that they can explore the world, so that they we can co-create knowledge. We can co-create spaces that support their, their ability to advocate for themselves, to find their voice, to use their own voice, but ultimately for us as educators to be self-reflective 
of our of our role in their development and how we can also be self-reflective about the power dynamics that are created in schools and that are reinforced in schools and often have marginalized various groups of our students and have been very harmful and do not lead to the outcomes that we hope, the positive outcomes, right? So really with these teaching and learning standards, this self-reflection process is also an understanding that there are systems of oppression at work. It's very important to acknowledge and understand how they operate in the world beyond the school system, um, but also within the school system. To ultimately understand as an educator, it is our job to learn from students. It's our job to have meaningful and relevant relationships and to value student feedback um, and, and ultimately honor and, and enhance student advocacy and ensure that those relationships with the student are also relationships with the family and the community because that's the context that the young person or the child is coming from. We have to always remember that children and young people learn in the context of relationships and that they do not exist as independent widgets. They're within an ecosystem that, that they bring to the schools. And so what was really interesting as we were developing these teaching and learning standards through the rulemaking process at the State Board of Education, a lot of what Jim had referenced was the critique, um, was that there was this left wing, you know, powerful group that was coming after education and uh, indoctrinating students with these um, teaching and leading standards. Well, first of all, there's no indoctrination of students, period. It's these are standards that are being brought up to the 21st century and the lived experience and reality of the students that are in our classrooms today. And we are trying to equip and prepare educators with tools and with experiences to be able to best meet the demands of students today. And so the idea that, you know, there, there is some kind of small group masterminding behind the scenes is completely disinformation. Um, because this one was a process that actually began under an administration that was conservative, was the former administration, uh, the previous governor. And the charge was precisely to create these teaching and leading standards. The other piece was to understand that it was a multiple year process that invited multiple voices, experiences, and expertise and geographies across our state and roles. And there was a very deliberate um, process that that was when as the as elements of the standards were being developed there was cross pollination there was cross evaluation and then it went through a very rigorous public comment process in which then the board would adopt and so these types of um exercises are incredibly important to the to the um nature of our educational system right we want to make sure that young people and children um, have opportunities to develop critical thinking skills. In fact, I would argue that the opposition to this work is actually an indictment on our educational system and that the opposition is not able to evaluate information and, and, and critically triangulate different perspectives and understand the importance of, of learning accurate history and bringing in multiple voices. So this is really, you know, an exercise and those standards are ultimately about what we call addition and multiplication, not subtraction and division. But, you know, the, the, the chorus gets so loud and the noise gets so loud. And what I can say that's really important moving forward and ways that we can um, support the efforts is that we get involved and we make sure that we as educators, as parents, as community leaders are at school board meetings, are interfacing with our, our school districts and the State Board of Education and other actors in this space so that they understand the lived experience that we have and the intention behind these things and involve us in the process. When I was a State Board member, I, I wasn't 
required to do this, but I would hold virtual town halls every single month. I had 200 people that I met around the state and kept on adding folks in from all corners because I felt very strongly about even though I was appointed, I needed to hear from the ground. And what I resoundingly heard from the ground from all corners of the state was the importance to center our education in children and young people and to equip them with the skills for the world that they are going to be inheriting. And that doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye and we act like the past didn't happen. It actually means that we jump into that space and we, we, emb we embrace the, the conflict and the importance of knowing these past harms so we can actually be about creating the solutions to mitigate those past harms. And so, I wanna just stop right there and I really am looking forward to the rest of the conversation. And I know there's gonna be some very concrete tools and tips um, that folks can um, enjoy, but please pay attention when these school, um, when the State Board of Education particularly puts out surveys or has these open forums to make sure that our voices that are really trying to center young people in this work and the, and the fact that we have to stand in truth and reality, even as ugly as the past was. And we need to safeguard that because that is the core of what education is supposed to do. And that is being an act of freedom and liberation as Paulo Freire, who is a Brazilian educator said that believed in developing critical consciousness as being the goal of education. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Senator. Um, I think it's really helpful, especially to connect uh, the response to those culturally responsive teaching and leading standards that were passed last year um, to the current fights. Um, and I think it's really instructive to see the, the parallels uh, that are happening in terms of disinformation around uh, things that our schools actually really need. Um, next up, we are kind of narrowing to the uh, district level. Um, we're gonna hear from Nathaniel Rouse. Um, Nathaniel Rouse is the first ever director of equity, race, and cultural diversity initiatives at Barrington Community School District 220. Um, previously, uh, from 2008 to 2019, he was the principal of Oak Park and River Forest High School, and he's now in his 26th year uh, in the education field, and dedicated to transformational leadership, service, and action to eradicate the systemic inhibitors in schools that create uneven outcomes for students based upon race and ability. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Rust, take it away. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Cassie, and good evening, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for the, the wonderful groups of the cadre of groups that have, have gotten us together and um, have us here tonight for this very important conversation. Um, I also um, just, uh, um, it's wonderful going after the Senator because one of the things that I think is um, um, important to also recognize um, is the rationale and the, the why behind the state making the decision that they did um, to shift to culturally relevant pedagogy. And the actual truth of that is in 2014, as it relates to, um, um, the student population in our in our entire state. Um, that is the year where um, um, BIPOC, BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color or students of color, Black and Brown students, became the majority in our state. And so as that has happened, um, we wanted to shift to make sure that we were being responsive to those shifts. And so many districts at the same time are now experiencing some of those shifts as well, which is why um, um, Barrington, uh, for example, was a district that, that um, created my position. Um, so uh, um, I want to thank uh, 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 Jim for kind of breaking down a little bit of some of the stuff related to critical race theory and some of the, the pushback with there. And I, I just wanted to spend some time talking about this from a, uh, a district level and some of the work that um, um, I'm doing in my district and hopefully um, can share some, uh, uh, some thoughts along the way about perseverance, um, you know, how, how we continue to do this work when people are pushing at us, then, you know, the intersection of critical race theory and history and, you um, you know, uh, uh, things of the like. So um, with that in mind, I also wanna say that uh, I'm a proud veteran 
Um, um, I check a lot of boxes. You know, I, I, I um, you know, I've been in education for 26 years. I tell people I know just enough to be dangerous um, um, from my previous experiences. And again, I'm, I'm a veteran. So when people talk about patriotism, when people talk about the flag, when people talk about what that means, it certainly means something uh, to me. So um, I always make sure that people know that as I have these conversations and uh, when people think that the perception of the work that we have is something that's indoctrinating, un-American or patriotic, I'm more patriotic than some people think. So uh, with that being said, um, um, you know, in the spirit of getting uh, uh, um, more bees with honey, the work that I do really is uh, twofold. Um, I firmly believe in order to make this work, uh, uh, this, this equity work, uh, 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 transformational in a homogeneous uh, school district such as mine, is, is it's important for me to also provide educational awareness and be transparent with our community. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've spent time um, getting out in our community, uh, talking about equity, providing, uh, providing opportunities for folks to hear what it is truthfully that we're really doing versus the, some of the things that are catching the national media attention. And so uh, an example of that was earlier this year uh, in September, normally in my role as a district administrator, I usually do a, a report in the fall and a report in the spring. And we moved that report up until uh, up to September uh, purposely and strategically this year so that you know I could kind of address uh, some of the groundswell uh, bubblings that were happening around the state and around the country relative to critical race theory. and. Um, um, I spent more time talking about what we were really doing and making sure that people knew that that wasn't what we're doing, yet at the same time understand that there are some connectivities. Um, I want to, speaking of critical race theory, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, Derek Bell, and uh, Richard Delgado. Uh, those three individuals are some of the uh, um, founders, if you will, and authors of, of what we know to be critical race theory. Uh, and they began actually having these conversations in the 60s and 70s. Uh, higher level thinking in, um, you know, in colleges and universities, really, really focusing on policies and procedures. And so, um, you know, one of the things that in particular uh, that's germane to this discussion that uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Crenshaw talks about is that there's this, this, this three, these three R's mentality. There is something that happens with race, then there's, then there's this reform that happens. And then after that, there's this retrain, uh, uh, re, re, uh, uh, retreating, uh, if you will. And so as I think about that and, and, and the social, the racial reckoning that happened two years ago, here we are again, you know, removed from some of the most significant um, protests that the world has ever seen. Uh, their racial reckoning appeared to be alive and well, right? Um, we even had the commissioner of the National Football Ball League um, in response to some of his players talking about doing a public service announcement of all things, saying that he believed that Black Lives Matter. You know, corporations followed suit and district equity uh, uh, and inclusion became the thing, right? And again, uh, my position that I'm um, afforded the opportunity to talk to you tonight, tonight about was born during that time. You know, but what she talks about is, is and again, this has been, uh, as Jennifer alluded to here, um, this has been historical. History kind of repeats itself. And we've seen these things happen before. It seems like whether it was the civil rights movement, it seems like whether it was integration of schools, um, the rebellion itself against slavery, there's always been this, this regression to the means, if you will, that she talks about. There becomes this grievance, grievance mixed with fear and righteous indignation, she says, that turns into a to toxic hysteria that stays under the surface, right? And until something, some idea is identified or some group of people can be shown as the people that are responsible and the repression against the very group of ideas happen. And so as we think about that and we think about how critical race theory and, and Chris Rufo uh, um, is the individual actually that um, uh, uh, Jim was referring to earlier that works for the Manhattan Institute. Uh, Chris, Chris Rufro was an individual that really, really introduced CRT uh, to the world as we know it. And uh, uh, Dr. Crenshaw was fascinated because again, uh, to be honest, um, this similar kind of approach of attacking CRT actually happened in the 90s, believe it or not. And it happened in the 90s in 1995, actually, after the verdict of uh, uh, the OJ Simpson trial. And what they tried to say at the time was one of the reasons that uh, OJ Simpson was actually uh, uh, um, uh, proven to be not guilty was actually because of this critical race theory. Now, at the time, there wasn't a social media beast that we have right now. So there wasn't really the, 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 the legs to really, really push this theory into the mainstream. However, there were articles that were written that kind of um, really spoke to uh, this notion of uh, an attempt to, to, to blame critical race theory, if you will, as this hysteria and why O.J. Simpson was guilty. So um, she thought that was fascinating. And we found it fascinating that that became the new boogeyman to address these feelings that individuals had as it relates to the racial reckoning that took place uh, just two years ago.
You know, so now here we are talking about voting rights again, you know, just like we did in the 60s. I mean, if you if you think about it and connect some of the dots, we've actually had more challenges to voting rights in 2022 than we did after the civil rights movement in 1964. So it's just fascinating to see how history repeats itself, which is what we're something that we're trying to event, right, uh, uh, prevent, right? Because when we do the same things over and over again, that's the definition of insanity. Um, I can also just remember, you know, just matter of factly, uh, as it relates to slavery, as the abolition, ab as the abolitionist movement uh, uh, began to take place, you can remember uh, that there, there were times where people were trying to do what with slaves, they were trying to keep them uh, from reading, to keep them from writing, to keep them um, out of books. Um, at the time, as a matter of fact, some of the, the jokes that have been, been said was that if you wanted to keep something from African Americans, put it in books. Well, that actually comes from, from back in the days during slave times, the attempt to not allow um, African Americans to read and write. And it's interesting how that little uh, incident, if you just 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 oppose that with what's kind of taking place with this banning of books, I mean, what are we doing to our children? I mean, how can our children be well-rounded and, and, and have a true understanding of history if we're not allowing them the opportunity to really, really uh, um, explore it? And so I say that to say, my work is focusing on creating a systemic transformation for my district, but I also want to have a transformation in my community. So I really believe in transparency. And so what I try to do is spend as much time as my community in the community trying to talk about our work so that, again, there's no surprises. And then when the bubbles come up, we're positioned a little bit better to support one another. Um, I think a, a coalition of willing of parents is something that I would really, really encourage anyone that is uh, doing this work. Make sure that you have parents and community members that are supportive of your work. And then again, keep them invested so that again, as these counter, as these narratives come to our boards, as individuals continue to come and start uh, um, challenging this equity work as they've been doing, you also can have counter narratives. You can also have counter stories. What I mean by that is I don't think it, it needs to be the lived experiences of, of students of color all the time coming up and, and talking about the trauma that they have, but it certainly means that we can have white co-conspirators and white allies coming to board meetings and talking about the positivity and the benefits of, our, uh, of all students uh, um, um, understanding empathy and develop, uh, equity and developing empathy. And why do we need that? Because again, in a homogeneous community such as Barrington, we want our kids to be able to leave Barrington and go and experience the world and have empathy and understanding of diversity so that when they go into the real world, they're able to uh, um, not be uh, accepting and not tolerate, but understand and have empathy and celebrate diversity, not uh, uh, opposed to it being a surprise where we fall back into some of the microaggressions that have continued to, uh, to, to happen historically. And so my work is focus on really providing professional development that focuses on race and identity and uh, culturally development, uh, uh, cultural development and the building empathy as it relates to, um, you know, race, um, uh, student ability levels, uh, cultures, religions, and the like. And so I spend a lot of time talking about uh, um, that. And so to, to that end, um, there's a couple things that I put in the chat. Um, it was, a uh, uh, unfortunately, they're not hyperlinked for you. I promise when I'm done speaking, I'll give you the hyperlink, but three things that I wanna talk about are three organizations in Illinois that I think are really, really helpful as you think about trying to have some, some strategic some strategic opportunities to provide educational awareness to your communities, as well as allow your parents uh, to be involved. And so the first one is learn from history. If you go to learnfromhistory.org, it provides a wonderful uh, a plethora of information about how to um, have conversations, frankly, uh, how to be able to navigate difficult conversations with people who maybe think differently. I think part of the problem that we're dealing with also is that we, we've, we've, we've We've lost our ability to communicate no matter what side we're on it, and we stick to our guns. And instead of you know, doing uh, uh, um, listening to understand, we're listening really to defend. And that's just a tough, tough place to be in. And so we're so divided. And so finding ways to develop empathy so that we can have these conversations is prime. And so I'm spending a lot of time with our leadership doing that. Um, Board of Education members, um, individuals also need to understand what it means to be uh, to lead for equity. And so I'm partnering with our Illinois State Board of Education to provide our uh, school, uh, our Board of Education, the opportunity to go through experiences themselves so that they can understand the whys. Obviously, we have data that speaks to why we need to do this work, but I also want our, our, our Board of Education members to have experiences themselves to help them develop empathy and understand that, again, they can be so powerful in helping us shape the trajectory 
trajectory as we move forward. And so I'm fortunate to be in a community that has a commitment to equity, that is really pushing that commitment to equity. And now it's time for us to do some of that action. Yet at the same time, I think it's really important to stop and make sure that our community at the very least has the understanding to, and, and, and awareness of what we're doing so that it's not a surprise. So as I continue to do this work, I wanna make sure that I'm also have my community lock and step to continue to do that. Um, that includes our faith communities. I was fortunate this year to be a part of a, a, a civic leaders union that, that took a lot of the very strategic um, leaders in our, in, our, in, in our school communities um, and our community, and we, we partner together to focus on equity. And I'm, I'm hoping that doing things like that will also lend itself to our educational awareness for our parents, as well as educational awareness for our community. So it's not just about the work that's being done in the school. It has to be work that also is, is happening in your community. Um, thinking of parent universities and opportunities for parents to really, really get their own understanding so that, again, that, that misinformation that Jim talked about um, um, and it, is able to be challenged in a way that is factual and, 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 and allows that opportunity for dialogue. And so we want to make sure that we can do that. Um, as I continue to think about some of the other things and we talk about this critical race theory and how, um, um, how uh, um, that has become a challenge and how we teach history. Well, um, what I try to really focus on is making sure that what we do is is truthful. I want to make sure that as we think about if someone was to ask me what it was that our district was really, really focused on and how we wanted to um, to really, really address these issues is that we, uh, as many of our speakers have already said, you know, we want our students and we want um, we want to be an inclusive district. You know, we want to recognize and celebrate our diversity. You know, we want to we want to have a, a connection to a his, to our past and, and and make sure that that connection to our history is truthful. We want to be truthful and not truthful in a way that we're divisive, but we're truthful in a way that it allows our students to be critical thinkers and recognize that how history time and time again has repeated itself over and over. And if we don't begin to challenge ourselves to do differently, then we'll continue to repeat ourselves. You know, the, the thing that, that I am um, thankful for is, is having a generation of, of students that are active, that, 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 that are ready to talk about these very the, these issues that we as adults really frankly struggled with as, as kids. Well, we haven't really done well and then as a result of that we're fearful that sometimes if our kids are 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 are, are given this information um, um that, that that all of a sudden is going to create this situation where either they feel bad about being being white or they're feeling they feel guilty for who they are and that's not at what the work is about at all it's all about building empathy empathy and understanding so that again history simply does not repeat itself and so i spent a lot of time in in my world focusing on the actual leadership portions of helping my district understand why it's important for us to do this work and then again challenging some of those perceptions that are out there that um, just are just misinformation and fortunately thus far far I'm happy that this approach has been helpful but I'm one that really feels that um, as we do this work we also have to allow for those conversations for individuals who maybe think differently I think we can have those conversations in in a way where both both sides can dialogue and again that doesn't mean that at the end of the day we're going to to agree lock and step but I want people to feel that at the very least they've had the opportunity to hear uh, from someone that I hope they consider an expert based upon my 26 lived, uh, uh, years of experience as an administrator and my 51 years, years of experience on the planet as a, as a Black man and, and, and how those uh, um, experiences have influenced and impacted my abilities to do the things that I've had to do. So I'm hoping that we continue to do that work in a way that is inclusive, transparent, and provides opportunities for our community to learn as well. I really think that that is so, so critical as we continue to do this work. Um, one of the other uh, um, resources I put in the chat there was called Teach Plus from Illinois. And Teach Plus is a group of individuals that really, really have gotten together and put some information together that really focuses on a design uh, for, for equity that focuses on recommendations for recruiting and retaining teachers of color. You know, as I continue to think about this conversation as I, and, I, and as I saw some of the questions that maybe have popped up, it was a lot of questions about how we can um, not just hire individuals of color, but most importantly, you know, retain them as well. And so um, Teach Plus, again, I'll put this in the, uh, in the link as, uh, in the chat as I finish, is give some wonderful tips. And just so that you know, just some of the research that they've, they've included in the 16 page document are some of their findings. And I'll just give you a couple of those as it relates to the experience and the importance of having uh, um, um, teachers of color because you wanna mirror the populations of your students. Um, 
research has always indicated that students, you know, need to see themselves. I mean, students need to see people that look like them in positions of power, in teaching roles, in administrative roles, so that they know, again, that first of all, they can, they can do that. They can be that type of person. And then more importantly, they also can see individuals that look like them in successful roles. And so we need to do a better job, I think, collectively in targeting um, 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 teachers of color so that, again, we can mirror our student population so that students can see themselves not just in the curriculum, as our senator has talked about with culturally relevant pedagogy. We want also for them to see some diversity um, in, in teaching and administrative roles as well. But some of the findings that they talk about is that teachers of color report a need for specialized uh, support supports that take into account the social emotional taxes that kind of take place when, oh, I don't know, being the only individual maybe of a particular color of a particular race that's in a room, that's in a district, mind you, that, that's, that, that, that's in, a, in, in a department. We want to make sure that we're honoring that to make sure that those, the, 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 the cultural and the challenges that that individual faces, we're there to support them. Um, the other pieces are that teachers of color report needing equitable access, you know, they want to have leadership opportunities, you know, um, more often than not in, in my roles, unfortunately, as, I, as, as I've looked at um, the demographics of staff, the things that's been challenging to me is always ask, asking the question, geez, you know, here I am in these positions of, 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 of leadership yet and challenging myself to try to find these different roles uh, for my students to see teachers and administrators of color, yet it always seems that the hiring that we do, it seems like it's, it's our custodials, it seems like it's our support staffs, and again, very, very integral people. I, I, I don't mean this in the wrong way, but what I'm saying and painting with a broad brush is, is that it's unfortunate that many times the individuals that we do hire of color seem to be those individuals that are in support roles versus those positions of power, versus those roles that have the opportunities to actually teach and learn. Uh, so I want to make sure that, um, again, that Teach Plus is something that we use to help and make sure that we are in a space where we are trying to do as much as we can. Um, in addition to that, um, the last thing that I put is, is something that relates to the sustainability of this work. When we think about um, the, the rationales as to why, and as the Senator talked about, um, a little bit about uh, the role that she played and the wonderful uh, recommendations that have been taking place in the state, there is this equity journey continuum that is, uh, is, is now something that our Illinois State Board of Education is, is requiring of our school boards uh, uh, or, or school districts. Many of you have heard about um, uh, Illinois school report cards, and to make a long story short, each school is going to be uh, is is actually going to be given a, a demarcation in particular areas that focus on equity. And I'm saying that to say that just means it's the opportunity for schools to continue to hone in on ways to keep equity on the table. And so I'm happy to see that the state is continually trying to hold districts accountable by providing these metrics in place that speak to A, where we are as it relates to an equity continuum, and then more importantly, what we're going to do, what actions we're going to take to move the needle to make sure that we have equitable access and opportunities. So uh, with that being said, I'll put a pin in what I, what I have to say. There's, there's so much more that we could talk about, but I look forward to the questions and answers. And again, I wanna thank you for this opportunity and look forward to, to uh, responding to some of the, uh, the questions that come as we do this a little later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rouse, um, and uh, for that overview of especially what districts can really be uh, doing in a concrete way for local school systems. Um, we are now going to talk hear from a teacher, uh, Julie Harris. Um, she is uh, uh, she's been an educator for thirty one years. She has an undergraduate degree in elementary education and a master's degree in special education and educational administration. And she is currently a special education teacher in Tinley Park, um, CCSD 146. And she's also serving her 10th year as union president for her council. And she's the recording secretary for IFT Local 604. Um, and we are excited to hear from her. Uh, thank you, Ms. Harris. Hey there, good evening, everyone. Um, I've been asked to speak about what I've been experiencing firsthand regarding disinformation campaigns during school board meetings on the topics of COVID and mask mandates, vaccines, and how critical race theory has become a hot button topic at school board meetings. I think Bill Briggs, president of Local 604, said it best a couple months ago that societal changes are beginning to occur, and many of them are starting at the local school board level right under our noses. Over the course of the last two years, I've seen a shift amongst several members of my school board in their disregard for teacher safety, 
when it comes to social distancing protocols in school, as well as wanting to push the envelope to get quarantine and close, close, close contact students back into school quicker than recommended by the CDC and IEPH um, without much regard to the safety and well being of our educators. We're living in fear right now as we await the decision regarding mask mandates in schools from the lawsuit residing in Sagamon County. What comes out of that court case will, in my thinking, give control of mask mandates in schools to local school boards. And right now I have no doubt that my school board would seriously consider to push forward to remove masks in schools at the request of the most vocal members of our community who have been showing up and speaking at our school board meetings. There have been many outspoken community members at our school board meetings as of late, and the theme to their allotted three minutes of public comment have consistently been masks, vaccines, and critical race theory. I actually went back over the videos of some of the most recent public comment portions of my school board meetings, and I'd just like to provide you with a snippet of some misinformation or disinformation coming from the public. Um, these are some direct quotes from community members that stood at the lectern during our school board meeting. And I'm gonna give you a few of them. Um, once the herd accepts mandatory vaccinations, it's over. Vaccines are genetically modifying children and sterilizing them for the greater good. Vaccine developers stand to make millions and many of you, as she points out to the school board members, are investors. Is there a kickback? to the school for every vaccine that they give out. Bill Gates said that if we do a good job with vaccinations, then the population can be controlled. Our children and grandchildren are the experimental lab rats for an experimental injection. I can go on and on, but I think you get the gist and I'm sure that all of you have actually seen enough appearance like these on social media, as well as at your own local level, spreading this disinformation in a public forum. Um, the next topic dominating my school board meetings has been critical race theory. My story is actually what led me to become a panelist this evening, and I just briefly like to share it with you. Um, as a union officer, one of my responsibilities is to update the Board of Education at their monthly meetings. I often share highlights promoting the wonderful things that the teachers in my district are doing in their classrooms. At the November 2021 school board meeting, I included in my update about a district wide program that had been launched for our educators. And that program was called the SEED program, which stands for Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. It's a nationwide program that, and I'm going to quote from their website what it is it partners with communities, organizations, and schools to train leaders to facilitate their peers in conversational communities to drive personal, organizational, and societal change towards social justice. Social justice. The SEED program prepares teachers to lead year-long school-based seminars on making school climates, curricula, and teaching methods more gender fair and multiculturally equitable. One week after announcing the district's participation in the SEED program at that Board of Ed meeting, an email was sent out to literally hundreds of people by a parent in the district stating that the SEED program is actually critical race theory in disguise. The email was addressed to state representatives, multiple area school boards, and to other known disinformation campaign leaders. The writer of the email provided a link to the board meeting and tells them my name, and gave them the exact mark time on the video of where to find me reading my statement about the SEED program. He also stated in the email that he was guaranteed by three of my board members that CRT would never be taught in our schools as documented by a conversation he had on his driveway with said three board members during their campaigns. He also went on in his email to ask why the district isn't providing literature to, to students and the community regarding Turning Point USA. Um, and he also asked why NRA and gun safety education isn't offered in our schools. So besides the disturbing nature of his email, he signed his email as Brian blank, proud deplorable and domestic terrorist. 
So this is where I became concerned, seeing how many people actually saw my name and my position in that email and his signing of his name as a domestic ter terrorist, it really frightened me. So I did go to my principal. We agreed to call the police. The police came and they took a report, but they said, there's nothing we can actually do about it. Um, about two weeks later, that same parent sent another email to the same hundreds and hundreds of people. And he again signed it as a proud domestic terrorist. And in this email, he specifically listed the names of three teachers in my district and he labeled them as promoters of CRT because of their membership in the Illinois Reading Council, which is a long-standing professional group for teachers of reading. And he, he was able to obtain their membership <clears throat> from ongoing FOIAs that he's consistently requested of the district. So as you can see, this is just a snapshot as what has become of our school board meetings. And I can only anticipate it getting worse as the discussion to remove mask mandates potentially looms in our future. Um, I was also asked to ask how the teachers in my district are dealing with these sorts of pressures stemming from the school board meetings. And I'm actually happy that most actually don't watch or attend the school board meetings because I honestly don't know how they would cope if they were to hear some of this disinformation being presented. I have seen more teachers in my district leave mid-year or just quit than ever before. And with these continued and ongoing disinformation campaigns taking place, I really, I don't know how to make it better. I don't know how to comfort their fears and their worries in, in what's to come. I would like to say that a strategy would be to educate our parents and our board members on the science behind COVID, as well as the truth about what CRT actually is and provide them with some more education. But I fear that these fringe parents who have taken over my school board meetings are too far gone to be able to bring back, bring them back to normalcy. All that educators right now, in my opinion, is just keep their heads up, push on, ignore this lunacy and continue to go to work and do what's best for our students. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Harris and uh, I think the, the next two segments that we're gonna have will really I think yours has really introduced it well about how important this is that parents and community members uh, stand up um, and you know support uh, teachers who are working on these issues. And I, you know, like should not have to fight in their after hours um, for the the schools that our parents and community members want. Um, and so I think that's kind of the focus of the next part. Um, we are going to hear from uh, Joyce Slavic of the Social Justice Alliance of Invisible Illinois. She's going to talk about what we can collectively do to push back. I think we will end up going a bit over 830. Um, so apologies to our panelists. We'd love for you to stick around a little so we can uh, ask you each another question. Um, and we also have two parents to hear from briefly after we hear from Joyce. Um, so Joyce, I will share my screen for your slides and hopefully not uh, slip away from them multiple times. Okay. One second. Uh, so uh, while Cassie's pulling those up, um, those presentations have been really outstanding. Um, the next section is, and I see a lot of questions about, you know, who's going to protect the teachers? Who's going to save us? Guess what? It's up to us. We're the ones. We're the ones we're waiting for. We're the ones who are going to have to to, to protect our teachers, protect our school boards, uh, and protect our students. Um, okay, uh, Cassie, you want to move on to the next step? Um, so everybody gets, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of organization on the other side, but seriously, don't despair. There are a lot of things we can do. So this is a, a busy slide, um, but I'm, I'm going to go through these. I know it's, we're running a little late, but I do want to run through, through these. I did share the link to the presentation, to our resource toolkit, which has a link to this presentation. A lot of the links um, are all the links in these, the presentation are clickable, so it'll take you to different places. But there, so you can either do a few of these things, you can do one of these things. There's something for everybody to somehow get involved. 
you have to show up in one way or another. That's the way that we're going to make change. So you can contact your school board by email. You can Google your, your district, Board of Education. You can There's, a, there's going to be links to, to send them an email. It doesn't have to be long. Be courteous. Don't be over-emotional. Um, everything that gets sent to your school board can be FOIA, which means somebody can get, get hold of that information. So just realize that. Be, be professional and um, courteous. Attend your school board meetings. This is absolutely something that we that, that really we need people to do. Um, if you go, you know, and I'm not recommending you go alone. Sometimes if your school board is kind of quiet, that's fine. Have somebody showing up, keeping an eye on it. School board meetings should be the most boring meetings in the world, and they are not these days. Um, show up and get people to go with you. Sign up to speak or show support. Um, Google the board of again. Google the board of education in your district. Find out what, where the public. You can usually click on a link. The agenda is often going to be online. You can figure out where the public comments fit in and what your parameters are. Um, if you have three to five minutes, practice practice speaking. Practice speaking with a mask. So when you go, you're not going to be uh, you know kind of thrown off by that. Um, really, really important. Show up and get other people to show up and speak. You can look at board, most board meetings are have um, live stream or they're going to even be saved. So you can look at them after the fact. So you may not be able to see the whole thing or stay for the whole thing. A lot of people leave after the, after the comments, um, if they're early in the meeting. Um, but realize there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens at the end of meetings. A lot of stuff where equity programs are being discussed and um, you may have board members that are, are trying to derail it or people supporting it. Um, at least if you can get somebody to watch that whole thing and share that information. Uh, recognize the groups that are showing up to your board meeting. Sometimes they may be not from your community, know who they are. Um, they may, uh, you know, are they organized? Do they have t-shirts? Do they have signs? Take pictures. Um, at our last board meeting, we had some, we had Proud Boys show up. Take pictures so you can recognize who they are. Um, network after meeting. So this is really, really important. And several of the, the speakers have spoken about this. Coalition building, networking. You cannot do it all by yourself because it is overwhelming. We've, we've had instances where somebody showed up, the only person speaking up against a loud group of, of pro-COVID anti-maskers showed up. They, they ended up building a coalition and had tons of people supporting. People, you know, I, I do believe that those minority um, people speaking up for COVID and against masks and against equity, um, I, I believe in most communities that they're the minority, but we have to be there to show up. Um, and notice and, and realize too, we, a lot of districts are in different places. Some districts are, are lucky that they have progressives on the school board so that you're really fighting to, to retain that. Um, you may be in a very conservative area, so you're going to have smaller wins, but still show up and have people show up. Um, and in our particular school, the so FOIA requests are actually also public information. If there's a link in your agenda and your online agenda for the school board, like we have, you can see who's making FOIA requests and what they're requesting. You'll see the groups are active in your community. You'll see the individuals are active in your community. A lot of these people are just um, trying to be disruptive and just antagonize the board and the people, the superintendent, the people who are, are, are dealing with this. I, we literally, one of the FOIA requests was, uh, for the last 18 months, I want every email where the word mask was mentioned. So this is really just harassment of the, you know, the board and the, and the, and the uh, administration. But we can use it to our advantage as well. Join local progressive groups. Again, coalition building is so critical. Um, they can be specific to your school board or they can be specific to your community. I know some people said, you know, the school board is important, but what about bigger? Normally, if you're looking at that, low, at that school board level, also, you know, recognize that that's going to branch out into your community and, and beyond. Uh, indivisible, NWSOFA, which is an indivisible, indivisible branch I'm part of, the, your local Democrats. Um, there are a lot of Facebook pages. And I know a lot of people complain about Facebook, but guess what? It's great for organizing. A lot of Facebook pages that are just for progressive and supporting masks or supporting progressive values in your school district, protect, protecting uh, equity programs. Um, a lot of them are private. So you may have to, again, when you're building your networks, if you're going to rallies, protests, school board meetings, and you find people that, that you're like-minded, make, make a date to 
it's over coffee where you're going to be able to share information and you're going to know what groups to join. And that's where you're going to feel like you're not alone. You're going to get great information. And when you need people to show up, like in our school district, when Proud Boys are going to show up, you're going to get enough people to show that they're not welcome there. Uh, witness slips, also a great way to look for witness slips protecting schools and education. There's a Facebook group for uh, wit identifying what witness slips are. Um, know who your school board members are. And you can usually, if you've gone to a few school board meetings, you're going to hear, you're going to find out what they're about. You're going to find out where they stand. You're going to find certain school board members who don't vote on anything. Well, that's really interesting, huh? Um, you're going to find where they're putting little microaggressions and call them, but call them out. And they're putting microaggression comments during the discussion in the school board meeting, call them out during the next public comment. Um, if you can't find medical professionals, mental health professionals, lawyers to be, be partners to speak at your meeting, they're often the people interviewed for a newspaper article. We had a pediatrician at one meeting who was spoke, talking about how masks damage kids' brains. Um, guess what? She was quoted in the newspaper. So if we can get people, you know, professional people to speak up, that helps a lot. Letters to the editor, really, really important if you can get those out there. Uh, if you write a letter to the editor, I recommend you don't go back and look at the comments. Um, tell your friends that that's out there, that you're your partners, your coalition, and let them go out there and comment for you and support. Um, create a group to attend school board meetings together. One thing that's really helpful, you can wear similar colors, similar masks. Um, we're talking about, we often wear similar colors because it's very visual support. It may not show up on a, on a video, but the school board will see it. The teachers and attendants are gonna see that. Uh, the other, the, the pro-COVID anti-mask mask people are gonna see it. The anti-equity people are gonna see it. And um, if, you know, when you have people that, that speak that you agree with, applaud. That's gonna be heard on a video. It's gonna show very clear support. Online petitions, they're not necessarily going to change anything, but you can use those in your comments as well. Pro-science petition, there's a link to one here, um, supporting masks in school, or, um, you know, there was one against the, uh, the lawsuit against the mask mandate. Sign those petitions and talk about them. You know, 2,500 people signed it. Uh, find out about your school board's curriculum policies. CRT is not taught in lower education, only taught in higher education, if that. Um, so find out what, what is covered. Curriculum, again, I, I, as one of the speakers talked, um, so in, our, in our district, we have a couple of conservatives who are trying to micromanage the curriculum. That's not the school board's role to actually evaluate everything in the curriculum. It's, it's, it's just not. They set an overall policies and tone, but they do not micromanage. They should not be looking at every book. Um, find out about your district's equity or wellness program. So we actually have an equity program. We have a wellness program. They're, they're, they're kind of fledgling new. We now have students involved in them because students spoke up at school board meetings. If they do that, support them. Make sure that they're supported. Get their information. Coalition build with them. because they When their voices are up there, we had students who've been booed at our school board meetings. If it makes you want to cry, but make sure that they feel supported. It will make a difference. Um, run for office. So important. If you have... Um, if you have any interest in running for office, you're even just curious about it. Um, there's a lot of, there's some resources on some of these upcoming slides and you'll see those in the presentation. Talk to school board members on your school board that you, you align with and talk to them about what it, what it takes, what, what's important. If you're attending school board meetings, you're going to know what some of the issues are. That's also really important. Um, we will help you. You can, you know, drop a note in the uh, question and answer. Um, we'll find a way to help you if you're interested in running for office. If you're not available, you can't, or for whatever reason you're not, you're not able to, find other people. Find other progressive people to run for office. Look who's speaking in the meetings. Approach those people and, and see if there's any interest. A lot of people maybe have thought about it, but if they're, if, if they're asked, they're more likely to, to think about it. Um, the next school board elections are coming up in um, 2023. It's not too early to be thinking about that. Sign up for webinars that are of interest, even if you can't always make them. Um, it's it's for the ones that I'm interested in. So it's just nice because I kind of get in there. You know, they'll they'll send me future future um, meetings information, or maybe you'll get the the recording link or something. Um, I, I, there's just so many really great things out there, and, and you can only go to so many, right? Uh, again, find allies at board meetings. Cannot stress this enough. You do not have to do it alone. You should not do it alone, and you probably can't do it alone. Um, 
but go, go up to people. If you, and you, what you might want to do, sometimes I'll do this. I'll just have um, handwritten on a couple of, or have a card with your, your email address, your phone number, your name, and just, you know, basically I, you know, I'm, I'm for this. If they hear you speak at the school board meeting and, and you've heard, you know, they'll, they'll recognize that you're an ally and then you can touch base, even if you can't do it at the board meeting directly. Uh, for your requests, we talked about, um, be a troll. Trolls are, um, so basically, feel free because they're, do, they're doing it in our groups as well. We try to keep them out and they're trying to keep us out. But if you, if you have the stomach for it, go into, um, you know, Awake Illinois or one of those groups and see what they're up to. See, see what kind of uh, disruptions they're looking to do. They have a big anti-mask uh, protest that they're, they're trying to push in the beginning of February. Find out about that so we can share that and be prepared for it. And we can tell our school boards what we're hearing. Um, share, collaborate, network, can't say it enough, and vote. Um, school boards, local elections, midterms, they're decided by a very pretty small minority. It is critical that we get out and vote right now, you know, during petition season, help help those help school board members and, and anybody local. Make sure you help them get on the ballot by getting petitions for them and then support them. Get them connected, get them connected with your different groups um, and do what you can to support them personally. It makes a huge difference. And these next few slides, we'll just go through them quickly. Some of the messaging, um, be inclusive, absolutely critical. We should all want an honest and accurate education for our children. All children benefit from our equity program. So there's some other things, um, reclaim freedom and choice. Jim mentioned that. Um, they don't get to you know, claim freedom and choice for only for themselves. It, it's really important. Um, repeat, the, repeat, make sure that you have multiple um, speakers and public comments repeating things. Say what we're for, not just speaking against them. Um, Use active voice. Don't amplify the opposition. Really try not to speak about CRT. I mean, let's talk about pro equity and, and positive things. Um, you know, it's, it's important about the kids. Call them out when they're lying, when they're lying about masks, or if a school board member's lying, call them out. History and sex ed is taught based on age appropriate information. Um, recent acts were passed this past summer so that uh, sex education is taught. Um, an appropriate level, it, they like to, to call it pornography. It's, it's not. It's, that, that act is very, very simple. Um, sex ed is probably already being taught there. It's just bringing up standards to that. Um, and note in a lot of like the, in the Sex Ed Act, uh, it's promoting um, talking about race. It's talking about LGBTQ rights. That's, these are things that the right wing and the conservatives really hate. To, they don't want that out there. And those are things that are really important in this act. So we, we want to make sure that's not getting silenced. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and you'll, so this will just be um, in the presentation. You can go ahead and I, I heard, I got some additional links here that we'll add for the next time that I saw from our presenters, um, but just some outstanding information, some uh, public comment samples. Use, use existing samples and modify it to your needs. You can use these very simple or as they are to email your board. Again, focus on honest, accurate education. Those are really our keywords. Uh, run for office. These are some links and some guides to running for office. Again, there'll be some, there's some links here. Talk to local progressive groups. They will support you and talk to board members who you're aligned with. They'll also support you. Uh, these will be some more resources and you're the one we're waiting for. It's not up to somebody else. We all have to step up. That's really what it's about. Um, and again, the, the link to this toolkit is in the chat and that also has a link to this presentation. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, and uh, as Joyce said, a lot of this will be shared um, for future reference for people. Um, we're going to hear briefly from two parents. Uh, apologies to people watching from home and our panelists that were running over. Um, and uh, panelists, if you do need to go, we totally understand. Uh, if you stick around, we will have uh, some questions. And but first, we'll quickly hear from two parents really to, uh, I think, give people hope on the ground that they can, and inspiration, uh, that they can do some organizing uh, and do some organized pushback. So 
First, uh, Kylie Spahn is a parent and public school activist who's passionate about protecting student rights, bringing quality to all public schools and advocating for the best practices in the classroom while fighting the abuse and misuse of standardized testing. She's been fighting back against book banning uh, attempts at her daughter's district in Downers Grove most recently. Um, Kylie, if you wanna go ahead. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, as Cassie said, I'm a parent of a high school student in Downers Grove. Uh, over the last 12 months, we have seen our school board meetings going from incredibly dull and boring events to uh, making national news. Uh, the most recent one being in last November, um, when we had uh, members of the racist, neo-Nazi, fascist, a group called the Proud Boys uh, attend our board meeting uh, with the intent to intimidate our school board members in the community. They were invited to the meeting by a member of a local far-right group who was attempting to ban the book Gender Queer uh, in our high school libraries. There were almost 200 people in attendance at that meeting. The majority were there to support our librarians, our teachers, the school board and our LGBTQ students. Approximately one third of the attendees were aligned with the extremist groups Awake Illinois and the Proud Boys. So how did we rally so much support? Honestly, it was a group effort, a small group of residents of both former and current students banded together to stand up for our rights and to support the LGBTQ students. Uh, and a group of students also banded together uh, and took action as well. Uh, we share the common value that we want inclusion and diversity in our community. Uh, Downers Grove has grown from an ultra conservative uh, town to an increasingly diversified and welcoming community. For the first time ever, our village celebrated Pride Month last year and it was heartwarming and wonderful to see how the community came out in full support. My group of community members, we could not sit out this one. Uh, we have been pushing back against the anti-maskers and the critical race theory screamers uh, for several months. Um, we were well aware that the next thing uh, on their list would be to attack a marginalized group of students in our schools in a homophobic motivated campaign to ban books they deemed pornography. Uh, this is a national movement and is happening right across the country. Uh, we knew it was coming. My group used social media to track the hateful rhetoric coming from members of Awake Illinois, Wake Up D99 and the Proud Boys. We embarked on a truth campaign, bringing to light how divisive and destructive the hate speech was to LGBTQ students in our community. Uh, the American Librarians Association was a great resource in connecting me with a committee member who walked me through the process of book challenges, uh, what questions to ask from our uh, school district, and ideas on how to rally the community. I also reached out to a youth leader of an LGBTQ teen organization in our village who helped me to highlight why banning LGBTQ books uh, would further marginalize and alienate minorities. Uh, we had meetings via Zoom to organize who would speak at the board meetings, uh, and we discussed what points uh, each speaker would make. Uh, we pushed back and we continue to push back. Uh, so what can you do in your community? It starts with two or three or four people. Have a conversation, set up a Zoom meeting. If you can meet in person, meet in person, uh, keep those meetings off social media, honestly, it just creates more fodder for um, the, the hate noise out there. Um, nominate two or three speakers for the next board meeting. Be respectful in your approach. Uh, try and take, uh, reclaim the conversation and stick to the issues that are actually real issues facing your district. Uh, finally, just be brave. Be courageous, be strong. You've got people out there that are willing to help and support you, like Illinois Families for Public Schools. Um, join Facebook groups of like-minded parents. And um, we can, you know, it may seem like your efforts don't count at the moment, but your small efforts really do count. And together as a group, we can really bring change for the good of all. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Thank you so much, Kylie. Um, 
And uh, next we have Jessica Jacob. She's also a public school parent. Um, she has a child at Algonquin District CUSD 300, where she's a member of the Parent Advisory Council. And she's been deeply involved in education issues in her community and has organized parents around anti-racism work, school board elections, and has also been mobilizing parents to attend board meetings to show support during these recent contentious times and has really been instrumental in organizing parents to support mask requirements, um, both in Algonquin and beyond. Um, so Jessica, uh, go ahead. Okay. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, guys, and good evening. Um, and thank you for all the work you're doing to protect our education system as well as our students. Um, like everyone else, we have um, experienced the same challenges within our district, so I will save you those specific stories. Um, and I will get uh, straight to the point with all the helpful, good information in, in an effort to keep this short so we can uh, get on with our evening. So um, I work with a group of parents in our community who are all passionate about supporting and defending our school district staff and board. Um, I really wish I could tell you about some exciting story on how we uh, got our group together to develop a solid strategic approach to surmount these challenges, uh, but we didn't, right? This just, just kind of happened organically. Um, so one of the moms in our group has a discussion group uh, for our school district on Facebook, uh, has about 7,000 members in that group. Um, as you can imagine, there's some uh, pretty serious discussions going on in that group and a lot being discussed these days. Um, but that makes it easy for us to be part of those conversations and see what's going on, right? Um, so that's been super helpful. Uh, during our last school board election, I quickly learned how uninformed our community was uh, regarding the election process, as well as details about the candidates. Uh, so I started an election group on Facebook to create a safe place to be able to share facts about uh, these candidates, um, as well as inform people uh, about the election process itself. Uh, the good news is we invited some candidates to join, all of the candidates to join. Um, and not only did they join, but they participated, all of them but one. Uh, we collected questions from the group members for the candidates, uh, collected a handful of the questions, and then allowed the candidates about a week to respond within the group. Uh, so we did this through election night and then reported the, the results from election night um, and then uh, archived the group until, until the next election. Uh, what we'll probably do is also use this group to vet people for our next board election as well. Um, another mom started a Facebook group, uh, as Joyce had mentioned, uh, for people in the community who support uh, the board to encourage each other. We talk about how we show our support during uh, the board meetings uh, as well as other areas. Uh, when we heard about the infamous DeVore lawsuit, uh, we decided to create a petition to give people a voice, letting everyone know we do not agree with the lawsuit. And more importantly, uh, we stand by our board and their efforts to keep our kids in school safe. Um, it garnered about 2,000 signatures in a week. So uh, we blasted it all over social media. So uh, nice to hear that there are so many people who are concerned. Uh, lastly, we're launching uh, another group on Valentine's Day across all social media platforms uh, that will include podcasts. Uh, we'll, we will be focusing on informing our community about topics such as local, state, and national politics, local school district, uh, mental health and community assistance and resources, uh, et cetera. So um, overall, what we basically learned is during this challenging time, um, people want to be informed, they want to get involved and or a voice to be heard, but not everyone has the same capacity to do so. So our goal has been to just try to give them easy access to the information, uh, options and resources they desire. Uh, so far, we feel like it's been working. We hope the community feels the same way. Um, and that's all I have. Feel free to, to find me on Facebook. I'm sure we'll be able to share contact information, but if I can help anybody out in any way, uh, I'd be glad to help. Again, thanks for having me and have a great evening. Thank you, uh, Jessica and Kylie. It's, I think, especially helpful for people to know that it is possible to do this work, you know, and just regular parents are doing it and you don't have to have a grand plan before you start, but you can really build uh, some impressive stuff, um, especially as uh, Jessica was just describing there. Um, so we, 
want to wrap up, I, I think we can want to ask um, both the Senator um, and Mr. Rouse a question quick. Um, both of you really covered a lot, I think, of what we'd want to wanted to hear from uh, on tonight. Um, so for uh, Senator Pasiana Sias, uh, you really talked about your experience on the State Board of Ed and the culturally responsive teaching and leading standards. And uh, I was wondering if you had anything to, to leave people with in terms of walk, working with our state legislators and uh, beyond just the state board, what the General Assembly um, can do to support uh, local school boards. Um, ah, so she is gone. So we uh, did, let's see if Nate is still here. I think, Nate is, oh, great. Um, Mr. Rouse, uh, our question that we have for you, um, I think is that, like you're talking about these periods of retreat um, and that we're sort of in that now. Um, and really what is, how, to, how best to move through these retreat phases and especially in terms, you know, as this is a statewide program tonight, do you have a sense of the, how much of this work is going on around Illinois? And if you're able to connect to other districts and other people in your position um, doing DEI work and trying to lead DEI work, uh, you know, how, how that can be expanded? Sure. Um, uh, first, um... Slow and steady wins the race. Um, as, as we know, um, I, I always talk and I talk about professional development, um, you know, using analogies and the power of storytelling is always important. But, you know, when we, you know, when we start, you know, prepping to run a marathon, you better do some practice first, right? You better have some running. If you want to be, you know, if you're a weightlifter, you're going to, you're going to lift some smaller weights before you start getting and tackling the bigger issues. And so um, one foot in front of the other, you know, uh, steps at the time, I, uh, taking a, you know, incre incremental steps at, at, at the time at a time is helpful. Um, that being said for myself, unfortunately, because uh, the role is relatively new, there wasn't a, a group per se. And so we started our own. Um, I actually am part of a uh, national um, consortium of, of equity directors that probably has about uh, 16 or 18 of us in the Northwest suburbs. We get together monthly and talk about um, you know, uh, issues that we have and work together in trying to uh, systematize this work. Um, that being said, um, you know, I think that people are exhausted. I think that unfortunately, again, there was such that there was this huge wave that we had of, of, of hope and, and we were just kind of seeing some of that, frankly, crumble in front of us, um, um, especially with, with, with a lot of the things that are happening you know, with the government and the things that we're seeing in social media and the things that are happening with our school boards. And so um, mental health, uh, um, taking care of yourself is important in these roles. I think as we continue to do this work, um, I think it's also important to remind us um, as a person of color, the, the burden is heavy. Um, I think it's really, really important, as many of us uh, I've ever heard people talk about, is, is stepping up and making sure that people are allies and co-conspirators in this work. And you, you, you spend time around people that are like-minded, where you're able to kind of process together. Um, um, I, I can't under, underestimate the power and the importance of, of me having a support network that is there, that's in the field, doing the work that I can really lean on and rely on um, when, in times where, where things are hard. And so um, I, say, I say that to say there are many districts that are certainly trying to do the work, but at the same time, you know, um, those of you in Illinois have probably just heard this week on some of the difficulties that are taking place in Hinsdale District 86, where uh, they went through the process, the rigorous process, process their equity team of, of selecting an actual um, professional development uh, a consultant to come and lead their diversity work. And unfortunately, that consultant, once she was named and once that, that was going to vote in their community, was, was hit with so many visceral responses and attacks on her social media that she graciously declined. Uh, she named it as a privilege to be able to, to decline working with that district and at the same time said that her safety is paramount. And she, based upon some of the things that were written to her and about her and the questions, she didn't feel safe in that community. And um, I know people in that community and I know that that's not gonna stop the work, but that's just an example again of, of the tactics and what happens when um, we're not careful and we're not um, uh, prepared to provide counter narratives in board meetings and at board discussions when we do have people that unfortunately have a difference of opinion. Um, it's very okay for people to have those opinions, but what I think I'm seeing, and as we were talking and in our groups, is that unfortunately, because of, of the 
how uh, some of the, um, the, 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 the challenges have been being expressed with this frustration. People are frankly afraid. People are scared sometimes to come to board meetings. And this is a time where we've got to move through that fear on behalf of our children, on behalf of the work, this work to talk about how important it is in reminding our board members, whether it's letter campaigns that you do, but they need to see you so that they can also stand in, uh, um, in, in the decisions that they make to support the work. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Rouse. I think that's kind of like the a very good like summary of what we wanted people to take away from tonight. Uh, so we we really appreciate that. Um, and let's see if I can oh, there. I'm back again. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much to all of our panelists, um, uh, Jennifer Berkshire, uh, Senator Pasiano Sias, uh, Nathaniel Rouse, Julie Harris and to our speak, our parents uh, bringing up their personal experiences organizing. And I hope people really take this away that like this is possible. Um, we need to get organized. You need to form coalitions. Um, you have to do the work, but it, it can, uh, you can have success in it. And so thank you to Kylie Spahn and Jessica Jacob for, for bringing that perspective. Uh, big thank you to uh, Jim McGrath and Joyce Slavic for their presentations. Um, they have been doing a, a lot of sharing a lot of that information on in a much broader and more detailed way on the third Saturday of every month. Um, so you can, uh, we will send out information about how to join those discussions. And uh, once again, thank you to so many of our uh, co-sponsoring orgs um, and in our sharing information afterwards. We will be sending links to all of them so you can connect. Those are another place to connect if you are working on this on local levels. A lot of them are in particular counties and cities. And so that's another place to uh, find connections. Um, and thanks so much uh, for our partner org, Indivisible Illinois. And once again, I'm with Illinois Families for Public Schools. Please stay in touch and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Cassie. Thanks.